Okay, everybody, welcome to the end of May and the May edition of the Toronto Jug. All right, so this is just our boilerplate slide. Uh, you do have to pay for all of the delicious food and drink you're consuming right now, so don't forget to do that. Um, after the talk is over, we usually move out to the front room, just behind that black curtain over there, and continue chatting about whatever. Um, please join our mailing list in our Google Plus community, both of which you can find from the uh, tjug.ca homepage. And uh, this and our last four meetings have all been recorded and posted to Vimeo, so check that out too. News. I don't have too much stuff. We'll just go through it quickly and then we'll get on to Dell's talk. Go ahead. Okay, so this is the uh, list of milestones, the current list of milestones working towards the final GA release of JDK 8. We're here at M7, which was May 23rd, and that's the feature complete milestone, so that's pretty cool. All the features that are going in are in. Um, there's going to be a developer preview in September, a release candidate in January, and the GA release is planned for March of next year. So much later than we wanted, of course, because it was that September date, basically, was when we were hoping for the GA, but yeah. Uh, these are the additional things, after they slipped the date from September to, to March, uh, the additional things that got added in to JDK 8 Milestone 7, so just before the feature complete milestone. Uh, most of them are related to tightening of security around mostly client-side Java, like applets and stuff, uh, which Mike was leading the charge to have removed from Java permanently, but he lost that, lost oh, that battle. Yeah, yeah. Like, Mike, you're talking about my argument with Mark Reinhold? Yeah. Which he basically insulted me. He said, he said no. So, <laughs> um, yes, mechanical checking of color sensitive methods. I didn't actually dig into that. Anybody? Sounds fancy. I don't know what it is. Um, statically linked JNI libraries. That sounds useful. Could be the topic of a future talk that Andrew would perhaps give. Give. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Um, document. Uh, JDK API support and stability. Again, I'd just be guessing if I said what that means. Um, this one, I know what that means, handle frequent hash map collisions with balance trees. So that's a common sort of denial of service attack against any system. If, if you know that the data you're giving it is going into a hash map and you know what the hash function is, you can feed it hundreds of thousands of records that hash to the same value and turn the hash map into a linked list and cause the system to essentially stop responding. Um, so they're going to be using balanced trees to store, instead of a linked list, they'll be using balanced trees to store all of the values that hash to the same hash code. So that's good security feature. And also HTTP URL permissions. That's just an enhancement to the, um, the HTTP URL connection class, which is old and will hopefully go away, but um, it will support permissions now. And we have a win. I think the first time in six meetings that the uh, Java zero day counter has not gone down mm -hmm. since the previous meeting. So we're now at 38 days since the last known zero day exploit for Java applets. It's good. Yeah. We'll keep tracking that. Um, and other news, uh, something Java related happened at, uh, at Google I.O. They announced that they are Moving towards uh, IntelliJ IDEA as the Android SDK platform of choice. Of course, Google's been providing the uh, Google plugin for Eclipse, which lets you do, um, what's the cloud thing called? Yeah, in Mike's opinion, that's the correct decision now. They can move forward. Um, what's that? App Engine, thank you. Yes, it has App Engine uh, support, it has GWT support, and it has um, Android support. This one is just Android, for now at least. Um, and so far it's just a developer preview, it's not feature complete, but it will be free to download and use, and people are generally positive about the news. That's it, unless anybody else, I, I'm sure I missed stuff, but 
Is that all that happened to Java in the last month? Yep. OK. So now Dell. Okay. Sir. Thank you all for coming. And uh, as I said before, my name is Dell Taylor. And I basically, uh, you know, I work as an IT consultant. I've been in Java for, for a while now, like a lot of you. Started in 96, 97, so I've been there for a while. And these days, um, I work as an IT consultant doing like portals and things like that. But I also put together um, a data, trans data migration framework called Data Pipeline. And that's what I want to discuss with you today. So I've put together some slides. And I also have a clips running in the background if we need to jump into um, some code. But um, I've tried to put the code right into the slides. So hopefully it'll be visible on this. And then we can go from there. So I've also put the slide deck on uh, uh, SlideShare. So if you just go to bit.ly slash Java data, you can pick that up there as well. So, so uh, our agenda today is basically we'll talk about what data pipeline is. Um, we'll look at how it works, um, the different data formats, um, uh, how to customize it, uh, the different tra transformations. And we'll also look at data conversion the different data conversions that are available. We'll also uh, talk about how to customize it, so how to create your own formats, your own transformations, and things like that. And then we'll look, finally, we'll look at uh, the code generator, because there's a code generator that's just up and coming right now, so we can uh, talk about that. So first of all, the question is, what is data pipeline? And data pipeline is basically, sorry, can you guys hear me OK? Yeah, all right. So data pipeline is basically a Java library or a framework, depending on how you look at things. It basically allows you to convert data from one format to another, transform it, change the structure of it, and actually transfer it from one data source to another. Now, the library is mostly streaming. Um, there are some cases where it can't be streaming, but for, for the most part it is. Um, it has multi-threaded support. There's a built-in expression language. And um, it's uh, offered as freemium. So there's a basic package which is free, and then there's some other additional features that you can, you can get if you uh, pay for it. So you can go and pick it up. There's a download. The download link is just go to northconcepts.com, that's the name of my company, slash downloads. And because you guys are all part of uh, Toronto Jug, I've put up an offer for you. If you go to uh, northconcepts.com slash tjug, then you can get a no charge complimentary uh, professional license. So I'll leave that open for about the next week. Just go grab yourself a license. OK, so first of all, um, how does data pipeline work? Uh, basically, it, um, it uses the whole pipes and filter uh, messaging uh, exchange pattern. So if you're familiar with you know, Java IO, using you know, working on the command line, it's basically chains together a series of uh, readers and writers and operations in between. And um, yeah, that's basically it. So instead of working with characters or bytes like you do in Java IO, it works with records. So um, diving a little bit deeper, um, it's built on what's, what are called data readers and data writers. So the data readers produce records. Basically, there's an open close method and a read method, which gets, gets you the record. And the data writers basically consumes uh, records. And the main thing on that side is the, the write, which accepts a record. So records are basically collections of fields. Fields have names, types, and values, pretty basic stuff. And in terms of uh, like the formats and the transformations, they're all implemented as subclasses of data reader and data writer. So you can see there's uh, like an XML reader. If you need to read Excel, there's an Excel reader. If you need to write Excel, there'd be an Excel writer. So, um, by the way, um, I don't really have a Q&A section. So if you have any questions, just shout it out. No problem. In terms of the field types that um, are supported, uh, it supports uh, basically all the, you know, all the integers. It's really following a Java type of approach, not a database approach. So it, it, the names will, will follow more the Java side. So it supports all the Java um, uh, numbers, a Boolean, the character types, and some uh, temporal types, blob, and then undefined. So if you want to put in your own type and uh, it's not you know, in this list, then you can go ahead and do that. That's not a problem. You, you just might have some challenges if you're trying to convert it to, say, a CSV file, right? So. 
So just to get into some code so you get a, a feel for what it looks like, um, this, this uh, example basically just converts a CSV file into a database. It just loads it into a database. So the first line, um, we just create a CSV reader, puts in the CSV file, and the second line basically uh, takes a database connection, a Java SQL connection, and the name of a table and just loads it in using the third line, which is just does the transfer, connects the two parts, parts together. Okay, in terms of uh, data formats, um, I mentioned that data pipeline is mostly streaming. So that uh, second column shows you all the formats that are streaming. Um, so right now it supports you know, CSV, Excel, fixed width, um, in memory. So if you want to basically, if you don't have a, like a persistent data store and you just want to convert some data that you might already have, um, like let's say you're pulling some data from Hibernate already and you want to convert it into records to be able to push, push it through the pipeline, you can use the in memory readers and writers. Um, it supports Java Beans. So if you want to take your Java collections, list, array, whatever, and push it into data pipeline, it can do that. Um, it'll use XPath to pull the data out, so just keep that in mind. Uh, database uses JDBC. There's a native uh, format, which um, if using, it's like Java serialization. Like Java serialization, you read the data and you write the data, and all, and all you care about is that it's symmetrical. You don't really care about the format. So that's what the native um, format is all about. Uh, it supports PDF, Word, templates. So if you need uh, to generate like some quick free marker based um, content, you can do that. It also reads web server logs and XML, uh, streaming XML using, using XPath. And with the XML, it's, um, it's only using the forward axes. So in XPath, there's a whole lot of axes you can use, like descendant, parents, and things like that. So in this case, it's using a subset, which are the forward, I think it's forward axis only. Do you, I think the axes are called forward only, right? So, so here's a, a, a different example. Basically, this shows you um, how to deal with XML. So in this case, it's just going to read an XML file, pull out some fields, and just display it just to the console. So the first line just creates an XML reader, takes in the file, Wherever you see we're taking in a file, we can also take it in an input stream. So if you're pulling data from, say, sorry, from, say, um, you know, the HTTP server request, just plug that in and, um, and you're working. So the second line, basically, the second, third, and fourth lines, they basically tell data pipeline how to create records. Uh, and the, the, the fifth line as well, how to create records. So basically, we tell it that the ID, the ID field is going to be you know, transactions, TN, and the ID attribute. So whatever it finds in the transaction element of the XML, sub-element TXN, and the ID attribute of that, it'll go into the ID field. So name will be the corresponding value in the name field, and price will just be whatever in the price um, element. And then finally, we can tell it how to break records apart. In this case, it's just on every transaction TN, TXN sub-element. You could add multiple record breaks. It's whatever suits your, your pattern and you know, whatever other fields. Right. So this example basically opens the reader, reads the records like you would in a Java I.O. or Java um, reader, and just prints it all to the console. In terms of uh, data formats, uh, excuse me, in terms of uh, transformations, um, there's some built-in transformations as well as you can add your own. But these are some of the ones that are built in, so you can filter, validate. Um, there's a generic transform that you can do a lot of different things with. Uh, there's sorting, so you can sort in memory, on disk if you need to. Like if you're sorting like gigabytes or terabytes or whatever, you can sort on disk. Um, there's uh, exclude fields, so this is basically your blacklisting fields, so you're saying, you know, I've got these fields, these records, just pull out, you know, A and B, I don't want them. Include fields is more whitelisting, so that's more like a SQL select statement, and that just tells you which fields do I want to keep. So you say I want fields A, B, and D, for example. Um, there's lookups, uh, you can rename, copy, assign fields, uh, you can create calculated fields. I mentioned there's a, an expression language, so you can use the expression language in the filter, validate, as well as 
creating calculated fields. So if you don't want to do that exactly in Java, maybe you want to load your expression from, say, a config file, then you can do that. Um, DMUX is basically um, just a demultiplexer. It uh, basically splits a stream into multiple substreams. <coughs> um, metering, basically just measuring the streams. Um, throttling, so if you need to basically uh, limit the amount of data that's transferred, so if you want to say you know, only one megabit per second, you can do that. Or if you want to base it on records, you can do that as well. You could say only transfer you know, 100 records per second or something like that, then you can do that with the throttling. Um, there's uh, remove duplicates, uh, sequencing. So sequencing basically just um, pulls together uh, you know, different input streams into a single stream. Um, aggregation is basically uh, just you know like SQL aggregation, so count, average, count, max, that kind of thing. Now async is a little bit different. Um, I, I know I put this all in the transformation slide, but it's more um, async is basically how you add threads, threading. So you can add an async reader, async writer, and it'll basically perform that operation in a separate thread. You can just tell it how big a buffer to use. That's about it. Can you get those results back into the, yeah, into the main? Um, so you don't really have to do anything. So just to, like those examples I showed you before, if you have like a CSV reader and, and you know, let's say it's pulling from a network or something that's taking a while, then you can tell it to buffer as fast as it can. So the way you do that is you just create a new async reader, pass in your original reader, so CSV or database or what have you, and then whenever you pull from the, the async reader, it'll just pull from its buffer. Okay. If it can't, then it'll just pull, actually pull from the underlying um, so the stream. Async's definitely lets it go as fast as it can. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, some frameworks, they basically add buffers and uh, threading at every level. But I think that's a bit wasteful from a context switching point of view. So um, I just made it so that you can specify when you want to um, include threads. This is mostly pure like pipeline. When something at the end of the pipeline wants data, it pulls, and it pulls all the way through exactly. the nearest async step. Exactly, <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah. You're right, exactly. It's a pull model. So um, in the case that you want it to be a little more efficient, because there's some step in the process that's a little slower, then yeah, you could put an async reader or even an async writer, and you can kind of connect them together. So. Um, another one is that's, a, that's not really a transformation is a JDBC multi-writer. It's a little bit experimental right now. It writes to multiple connections simultaneously, but um, yeah, I just put it here so you can see that. And then there's the multi-writer, which writes to multiple streams at once. So. Okay. Um, diving a little bit deeper, uh, basically all the transformations are implemented as data readers and writers, like I mentioned before. The main difference is that they tend to extend the proxy reader and proxy writer. So if you're familiar with Java I.O., Java I.O. has got filter input stream and filter output stream, I think. So this is basically kind of like that concept. Basically there's a nested data reader or nested data writer, which is the real target. And, um, and then there's a protected um, uh, intercept record method that you can implement. You can certainly implement the read method, but this is probably the easiest thing and you know, perform whatever operation um, you want if you're planning to, to customize it. So for example, we've got the filtering. I mentioned this filtering, validation, and so on. And those are all implemented, as I said, as subclasses of the proxies. So same with the async. So just delving a little bit uh, into the code now. So this example basically takes data from a CSV um, file and it converts it to a fixed width file, fixed width file. But in the middle it does a whole bunch of transformations. So the first line creates the new CSV reader and it basically says, you know, the field separate is a pipe, so it's not really CSV, it's delimited, but everyone looks for CSV, they don't look for delimited, so that's why it's called CSV reader. Um, Next it says that the field names are in the first row. Um, the second bit here where we create the new filtering reader. So what this is doing is basically saying that look for, the email, look for a field called email and if you find it, um, look for a value that, uh, that's a regular expression, in this case ends with .com and those are the records that we want to keep. So the filtering reader basically just matches records that, that matches the pattern and just keeps them. Everything else gets discarded. 
So that line grabs all the records where the email ends in .com. The next line basically says that these are the only fields that I want. I only want the email field, first name, and last name fields. That's it. Everything else gets discarded. And the next line, the transforming reader, basically just does rename. So renames F name and L name to first name, last name. Um, these could be combined because you can see that they're both just operations on a transforming reader. I just added it like this for readability. That's about it. And the, last, uh, the second last section here now creates the fixed width writer. And this basically, you give it the target file name, you say that um, it's got the three fields, so I want them to be 64 characters, 24 ca 20 characters, and 20 characters. The uh, field names are going to be in the first row, and then it writes them. By default, the padding is space, but you can change it globally or on a field-by-field -field basis. So. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, the question is, what does it do if the data doesn't fit? For example, I think emails are like 254 characters. That's like the official length. So obviously that might not fit in a 64 uh, character field. So um, it'll either truncate it or it'll, you can throw an exception. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, other yeah, things. other things, exactly, yeah. So that's up to you, right? So is that field by field when you're setting it up, like when you're configuring the CSV right? Sorry, the fixed width, right? In terms of, uh, of the ex exception? Yeah. Unfortunately, right now it's global, but that's a good idea. <laughs> so what was the question? The question now is, um, is it a field by field setting that lets you decide if it should truncate it or if it should just throw an exception? So I said it's global, but it's a good idea. So we'll make it field by field. All right. Thanks for that suggestion, actually. OK. Um, so the next section is actually looking at, um, at actual data conversions. So data conversions are very much like transformations, but it's just a special case. That's all. Pretty much everything you can do in a transformation, you can, everything you can do in a con data conversion, you can do in a transformation. It's just um, easier to lump them all together. So we looked at the transformer, the transforming reader before. And uh, one of the things you can pass into the transforming reader is a basic field transformer. And that basically has uh, methods to do conversions from you know, whatever to dates, um, numbers to whatever, strings, uh, string to whatever, whatever to string, null to, uh, null to whatever, does some rounding. There's also uh, uh, some string manipulation in there. So, you know, insert, append, prepend, substring, padding, replace, ranges, and so on. Um, and you can also add your own. And the main thing I'll point out about this is that uh, if you guys are familiar with the Fluent interface, way of writing APIs. OK, so Fluent interface, basically, um, you call it, when you call a method, the method returns this. So that way you can keep calling methods, right, without having to, to get a reference. And, um, and if you're off, well, so what that does is it lets you just basically kind of declare what operations you want to perform on a particular field, and then once it goes through the transformation, um, those will get applied. So here's a, just a brief example. So you can say, like, you plug this in into the XML example we had earlier, for example. Um, so we create a transforming reader that wraps the original reader. And we say we want to perform some transformations on the ID field. And all you want to do here is convert strings to long. That's about it. The next field is price. So if you get a null, null to value means if, if there's a null value, just convert it to zero string. And, um, and then convert all the strings to doubles. So at the end of the day, that price will be turned into a double. So. And the final transformation is just a date. Pretty simple stuff. It uh, just takes a date field, converts it from a string to a date using the pattern from, a, from Java simple date format. And then if there's a null, just convert the null to, uh, to today's date, just a new instance of date. So, right. And order matters. So these things are getting um, uh, basically applied in the order that you define them here. So if you switch them around, then you know strange things may happen. So, just a question about if uh, is a transforming reader and all of the transformers are 
they thread safe so I can instantiate one and just keep reusing it for many different readers. So, so are you asking if the transforming reader is thread safe? Yeah. So the way I would answer that is it's like um, Java IO, right? So Java IO, you, is it thread safe? Uh, I would say no, um, because it depends on the underlying stream. Like, I mean, if you have a database connection, that'll be thread safe. But if you have other things and you try to use them in multiple threads, it's probably not going to do what you want. So typically, if you need multi-threading, then you should use the async reader and writer. Um, but I wouldn't try to um, take something and use it uh, like create an instance of basic field transformer and try to use that in multiple threads. Right, so you, can, yeah. you would probably create a new one each time rather than saying, yeah. oh, this is this kind of field transformer. Right, and I mean, objects are cheap, right? So we have gigabytes of memory. Um, so like, it's not the days where you know, we're trying to fit things into a kilobyte. So I would say just instantiate it. And uh, it'll also save on, on like memory, potentially memory leaks and things like that as well. So. Okay, so we just blazed through basically, you know, a high level of um, of what's in data pipeline. The next section really goes into customization, so that's where where we'll look at uh, more of more code. Um, do you guys have any questions before we move on? Yep. Can I set whether I continue, whether I break, how I identify where it broke? Um, yeah, so you saw that we were using, um, let me just go back a couple steps. So at the bottom, we've got like the job template, and that's really what governs the transformation. So there, we're using the default and just taking a reader writer, but you can actually um, uh, do what you're asking, which is you can decide whether to continue on error or. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yep. So, okay. Any other questions before we go on? Oh. Okay. It's so, in terms of customization, we'll look at uh, customizing. Sorry, we'll look at customizing formats, transformations, data conversions, um, filters, and validations, which are really the same thing, and uh, lookups. So. In terms of creating your own data formats, basically all you do is you subclass data reader and data writer. You implement the read implementation method and the write or the write implementation method and, uh, and, and obviously open and close as well. So. so here's an example. Can you guys actually read that at the back? Yep. Okay, good. I was not sure if it would be too small. So there's a lot of code here. On the left side is basically a new reader which just reads property files, like you know, resource bundles, right? <coughs> um, in this case, it's got uh, a field reference to the properties file and uh, then something which is the keys, which we'll get to. And there's one constructor right now which just takes in the properties, but if you're creating something more production ready than, or reusable, then you know, you'd probably want to take in an input stream and a file as well. Um, so the next line is, the next method is the open method, and all this does here is basically grabs the property file, the property that came into the, into the constructor, and, and just starts getting the keys from it, that's about it. And then the close method just sets it to null. Um, so the guts of it is the, the last method, which is the read implementation. So this looks at the keys, and it just checks to see if there are any more keys, and if they're not, then it returns null. So that's the end of the stream. Um, basically what it does now is, it, if there are keys, it'll try to get the next key and also get the next value. It'll create a new record and then put the name and the key and the value into the record and then return it. So that's about it. Um, how you might use something like this is in the top right hand corner. Um, let's say uh, you know, you're reading in some properties. You can create the property, load it create the, the Java util properties, load it, into, load it from file, and uh, then pass the properties into your properties reader. And, uh, and then you can create a, a writer, which is basically a stream writer. All it does is writes records to, uh, to, to, to whatever stream you passed in, but as text, right? And then finally, we just call the transfer method. So given a property file that's got 
you know, TX equals transaction ID, um, you know, symbol equals symbol, uh, DOB equals date of birth, sorry, equals birth date. Um, if you ran it, it would produce um, the following uh, uh, output. So, for example, if you wanted to load your properties to a database or something, then you could do something like this. So. Uh, any questions on that? It's straightforward. Okay. Okay. So the next um, section is dealing with transformations, and you actually have two options for creating transformations. So the first option is basically subclassing proxy reader and writer, like we talked about before. So you basically subclass a proxy reader or proxy writer, you implement your intercept method, your intercept record method, and, and you're, you're done. So here's an example of that. Um, so this is a, a, what this transformation does is it basically takes a record and it, it uh, creates multiple records for it based on the languages that you passed in. So for example, those properties that we were looking at earlier, um, you can basically create a record for each, for each uh, language that you're dealing with. Um, so this reader, it takes in, uh, the constructor takes in the nested reader, so that's the actual underlying reader that you're, going to, that you're working with, and then it takes in uh, just an array of locales, and then uh, the main part is the intercept method. So what the intercept method does is it takes a record, returns a record, and the default implementation just returns the record that, that it, it accepts, in this case, what we're gonna do is loop through all the locales. Uh, we create a copy of the, the record that was passed in, so that's the clone. And, um, and then we say copy get field locale and pass in true, so if, if it doesn't find a field that's called locale, it'll create one, that's what the true means, right? Kind of a cheating way of creating fields. So it creates this uh, locale field, and we say set the value, the value to uh, the locale, and the next line is, is, the, is probably the most important line, push copy. So it pushes that copy into the buffer of this proxy reader. So that way, um, instead of um, whatever this method would return, the next call would actually get, that get the, the record that was pushed in. And finally, we return null. So instead of returning the original record, we just, it goes nowhere. Like, right. So it basically just turns your original record into a record per locale and just gets rid of the original one. And the way that you'd use it is in the bottom corner here. You instantiate your new I18N reader, pass in a couple locales, in this case, English and French. And uh, when you run it, it'll produce the output on the right, which is um, basically a record per language. So you can see the new field at the bottom of every record, which is the number two field, locale, is ENFR, ENFR. So. Okay. So I mentioned that there are Two, at least two ways that you can create transformations. And this way is, is the most powerful way. It gives you complete control um, of exactly what happens. But the second way is to use the transforming reader, which we've been using already, but um, pass in a, a subclass of the transformer. So you create your own custom transformer and pass that in into the transforming reader. And there's a couple benefits of doing this. Uh, first of all, the transformer reader will handle all of the errors. Um, it'll handle all the exception and things like that for you. And it will all, it all, transformer reader also has a filter. So if you want to have conditional transformations to say that only apply these transformations, you know, in a certain case, then you can do that by setting a filter on the transformer reader and then just add all your transformations to that. So the code looks very similar, it, in this case it extends the transformer, um, takes in the locales like before. In this case it does not take in a reader because that's not the responsibility of this class. And then we implement the transform method and this method is a bit different from the last one. So it takes in the record like it did before but in this case it returns a boolean. And um, yeah, so again, the, re this, the method is very similar. We take uh, all the locales, we loop through them, we clone the, clone the record, we add the locale field like we did before, but the difference is in the last three lines of this method. So within the, um, within the, the for loop, we get the reader, 
So if you're using a transformer, then you automatically get reference to the, to the, the transforming reader. So you get the reader and you call a push on that, so push the, the, your copy, your record copy in there, and then you delete the original record. Then you just return true to say this is, you know, everything worked fine, so keep going, as opposed to stop. And then, um, and then finally, this is how you'd use it. You create the, on the bottom, you create the new transforming reader, and uh, you add in the new IATN transformer, and you pass in a couple of locales. So, so this, 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 this code works fine, but there's probably a little bug, or if I was doing a code review, I'd tell a developer um, maybe to make a change. See this? Can any, can you, any of you see what, uh, like if you're doing a code review of this, <laughs> can you see what kind of a change you'd make to say the transform method? If, um, just to make it a little more efficient. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you a hint, it's the record. I'm doing something with the record every time that I probably shouldn't be doing, or probably don't need to do. Do you need to make that many calls per language, or? It should be up to the code loop. Exactly, the deleting. So I'm deleting the record every time. I mean, it's okay, because it's just setting a, a flag on the record, but there's no reason to call record.delete every, for every locale. You just put it out to the loop. So. All right, so those are the two ways of, of creating um, transformations. Sorry, Doug, I have a question. Yep. So if you've got a whole bunch of trans transforms chained together, yep. and then when you're talking about the record, how's that going to look? Because the transform that's in front of them in the chain, it could have duplicated the record and all that kind of stuff. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So the API is primarily streaming. So the question was, if you have a whole bunch of transformations chained together, then the record is, like, what's in the record, right? Because any, at any given time, you know, a transformation could be doing different things yeah. to the record, right? That's exactly what I'm asking. Right, right. So um, I mentioned it's a streaming API, and one of the um, consequences of that is that each record can be different than every other record. So you actually can create records that don't look like each other, right? Um, what that also means is that as the record flows through, it may be different at each step, right? So once it gets to, um, you know, one step in the transformation, maybe you add some fields to it, or you delete it, or you duplicate it, then that record might be gone. It might not even be there. So whatever is produced by that step is what's going to be um, consumed by the subsequent step. So the record that we see here is basically the output from the previous transform. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So. So when when you delete the record in the stream, mm -hmm. what happens? Like, does, does that mean this step now pulls another record because it, it needs to give a record to the next step downstream? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So. Um, if the records are flowing through and you delete one, then the next thing, uh, basically, um, the way the system works is it tries to ask for a record, and it just basically asks, it basically waits until it gets a record, right? So if the records that are coming were, are deleted at a higher stage, then it just never gets to it. So the, the lower level that's still waiting just keeps waiting. Yeah. So, okay. So that was transformation. Now this is uh, data conversion. And I mentioned before that conversions and transformations are really the same thing, right? Just a special case here. So there are probably a couple ways to, to do conversions, but I'll, I'll just show you one here today. And that is um, basically using the uh, transformer, just like we did in the last example. So we basically use the transforming reader and the transforming reader has, uh, you know, we can add transformers to it. In this case, we use one of the special transformers, which is a field transformer. It takes in a field name, and uh, you know, it does some things by itself, like it looks up, um, you know, the field from the record, and then it has a method called transform field, which is the one that you implement, right? So that field that gets passed in is the one that has the name that you passed into the constructor. So for your custom transformer, you basically implement the transform field method. And I would also recommend that you implement the, the, implement the two string. And we actually should have implemented that 
in the other transformers as well. And the reason is because it helps when you're diagnosing problems. And I'll show you what that means. So take this, uh, this conversion method. So this, this conversion uh, transformer basically converts bytes to strings, right? So just a byte array to uh, a base64 encoded string. So the constructor takes in the name of the field. We implement the transform field method, which takes in the field that we're working on with, with whatever name that was passed in into the constructor. Um, so the first line of the transform field method basically grabs the value. If the value is null, then we just want to make sure that the output of this method produces strings. Even if they're null, we still want to set the type as a string, regardless of what it was before. So we have field set null, then we just return, and that's the end of this method if the value is null. If the value is not null, we just want to check and see, is it a byte array? And if it is a byte array, that's when we'll use the Sun Oracle base64 encoder to convert it from, from uh, bytes to a string. And then we just set the value on the, on the field. Getting oh, really? <laughs> awesome, okay. <laughs> All right, so we don't have to include those undocumented or unsupported. Secret. Right, okay. It's like the, using the FTP client in the old days, yeah. Okay, so if the value isn't a byte array and it's not null, if it's something else, something date or something, I don't know, then we just throw an exception and we say field is not a byte array and, um, and then we can set an arbitrary field on the exception. So, um, you know, it, it depends on which, which school of thought you're, you're, you're part of, but uh, for me, I think um, exception should allow you to set arbitrary fields, and that's why I've got this here. And the field name kind of is kind of strange. I put a few zeros just so you can tell in the output which one we created here. So in this case, um, if an exception is thrown, we'll see this field 000, and that'll be some field value. So, and finally, we, we impl implement a two string. And in this case, it just says converting field, whatever the name is, from bytes to string. So. And if we, need to, if we want to use this, uh, this transformer or this data converter, we basically use the transforming reader like we've already been doing. Maybe we use the uh, old IATNN transformer like we did in the last example. And then in this, the last line basically just says transform um, whatever, you know, the value field from uh, bytes to string. So now, in the example we've been looking at, um, we do not have a field which has bytes, so it's going to fail if we ran this. And that's what we see in the next screen here. So this is an example of like, the kind of exception information that you get. I know it's a lot, but hopefully if you have an error, then you, it'll pretty much tell you exactly what you need to do, Wh what happened. So in this case, you know, it fits as exception in main. Um, data exception, transformation, and in square brackets it'll give you the name of the transformation from the two string. So converting field value from bytes to string, failed on record zero, field is not a byte array. It's okay if you don't implement two string, it'll just, still, it'll just say the class name. Um, and now the interesting part is before all the stack trace information, you get some context info. So stack trace gives you the location, but often you need to know exactly what was the, the, the state of your application or reader or whatever. So here, for example, it'll say, you know, the state of the endpoint was opened, it was in the main thread, it happened at this time. Um, buffer size is zero, so there was nothing pushed into the buffer, um, nothing waiting. It was the first record, uh, the field transformer dot field says the field that we were transforming is the value field. Um, it is supposed to be of type string. It actually has the value transaction ID, and its actual value is a string, a Java lang string. We just strip off the, the package. Um, and then it gives you some other things about the filter. So there's no filter on the transforming reader. Um, the transformer we're on is the convert field value, convert field value from bytes to string. The class is the one that we just created. It's the second transformer, and again, it gives you some other stuff. And you can see the second last value is our field 000, which is the one that we added on. So if you need to add in your own context stuff, then just go ahead and put it in. And one thing about uh, how the whole exceptions work is because you can chain readers and writers together, it actually traverses the whole hierarchy to grab all the state information as it goes up. So, and then you get the stack trace. So, so that's about that.
Um, the next uh, section is basically uh, working, creating your own custom filters or validator, validations. Uh, basically, validations and filters are, are the same thing. It just depends on which uh, particular reader you use. So here we've got the data reader, proxy reader, um, and we've got the filtering reader. So the filtering reader is what we've used already, and you can add filters to that, or if you want, you can use a validating reader. And the main difference here between filters and validator is the filter says, only give me you know, things that match this criteria, and the validator says, uh, if it doesn't match, then it's a problem, right? So, and that's why we've got the exception on failure flag in the validating reader, so you can turn that off or on. And uh, there's also discard methods, so if, um, in the validating reader, so if there's a problem, then you can just intercept it and do something at that point. Maybe, you know, funnel it to a dead letter, sorry, uh, uh, an error queue or something like that. So. Now, regardless of which one you use, you basically have to create a, your own subclass of filter. And in and there, you would just um, implement the allow method, which takes in a record, returns a Boolean, and that's about it. So, so here's an example of a filter. And this filter is staying on our themes of, uh, of resource bundles and locales. It basically only wants, um, it, it, only, it ma basically matches records where the locale is one of the ones that I pass in, right? So you pass in a, an array of locales and uh, it'll loop through, try to get the locale field in the allow method. If, uh, if the locale that it's looking at matches the current field's value as a string, then it'll just return true. It means that I, I just saw one of, the field, one of the records. Otherwise, it'll return false. And the way that you would use it is, as you'd expect, on the bottom left corner here, we've got a uh, filtering reader, and we can add in this IATN filter and just pass in our locales. And if we ran this through the examples we were using earlier, then um, we would just get these three records. Because in this case, I'm just saying, just grab me the French ones, the French um, records, and then that's what will happen, so. Okay. So. So if a validation sees something it really doesn't like, can it cancel the whole, thing? Oh, I guess throwing an exception is going to propagate all the way back to like the top of the main thread, right? Yeah. Um, so if you're using the validating reader and, um, yeah, you, you actually have a choice. So you can just set the, uh, so in the bottom left, there's, there's, a, there's a flag exception on failure. So you can just set that to true, and yeah, it'll throw an exception. It'll just blow everything up. But if you want to kind of continue, then um, you can just set it to false and just implement the discard method, and then that'll, you can do whatever you want with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, something. What if, like, what if you do want to just abort the whole batch when you see some bad data, and, like try again from the beginning after um, then you can just set the flag to, uh, to true, and then that'll just... Um, so will, will the eventual writer at the end of the chain find out, or do you have to clean up? <coughs> like, basically, like you have a file writer, say, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. just partway through writing the file. Right, so that's like a transaction, for example, right? Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, there's no transactions, per se, built in. Um, that's really something that you would have to implement on, 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 on whatever you're using to, to run the transformation. Okay. So basically if, um, if you know, that sequence of operations don't complete, uh, if they complete successfully, then you commit, right? right. Yeah. If they don't, then you can, you can so whatever rollback means for you. And right. that, that so might be a compensating. Writer, like the writer interface have a way of telling the writer that you want to commit or roll back? Does the writing interface know? With the JDBC writer, it's obvious how you would implement that. But like with a file writer, you can say the file you were working on or not delete it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it sounds like what you're talking about is more a compensating transaction because, like in files, there's really no um, you know transaction. Mm -hmm. So um, Jonathan is asking about like how do you handle failure, right? So if something fails on the read side, how do you um, how do you handle those records that have already been written, for example, right? And really the answer right now is a compensating transaction, which is you see that something bad happened and then you do something um, to, to rectify okay. what was already there. Yep. So you just use, 
Java. Use Java. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. You use Java. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Right. Something called transactions. So, sorry? Something called transactions. Like in a database, you have a transaction. Yeah, so yeah, if you're, if you're writing to a database, then definitely transactions are, are there. But if you're writing to you know, some file system or something or sending it over a network, you know, once it goes over the network, right, it's, it's gone, right? So you maybe have to send like, I don't know, some operation or some command that says, you know, the last thousand records you saw or, you know, the beginning of this queue, just discard everything so far, right? Yeah. So, so the, the provided uh, JDBC writer, is it just sort of like transaction agnostic? Or? Um, so by default, it is transaction agnostic, correct. But um, it supports uh, batch updates as well. So you can say, um, so by default, it tries to write one record at a time. But uh, if you want it to be more performant, you can say, you know, use batches of like 50 or 500 or whatever. Okay. So that's just, you just say set batch size to whatever. And then um, it'll behave a little bit differently internally. So it'll use the, the JDBC batch um, <laughs> updates and it'll try to, um, to basically batch them. <laughs> and then when you yeah. close, it just flushes out the extras. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So can you yeah. commit on the boundaries of batches? Can you commit? Can, can you commit on the boundaries of batches? Yeah. Um, definitely. I'm just thinking is that. Um, if you load, let's say, a million records, you don't want to put one, no. one transaction, you will generate the whole batch. Right, time. right. So if, if you're doing that, I would say turn off transactions, right? And uh, yeah, set your. Feature because many times when we need to load a lot of uh, stuff into the database, yeah. we would commit, let's say, every 10,000 lines. Okay. So yeah, Oracle has a big change set. With Oracle. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Most databases don't care, but Oracle doesn't like large change sets. And, and rollbacks are especially expensive. If you put in like 15,000 records and then you decide to roll back, that's like a five minute job. Sure. It wow. It's fast because it's already written in, but rollback is a. Like, yeah, mm, yeah. I don't think about that. Right. right. Interesting. Um, yeah, I'll have to look at the commits. I'm, I'm pretty sure that you can uh, that you can commit it on the boundary, um, but I'll have to ch check the code. I mean, I could do it here. Maybe after we're, we're done, I'll take a look for that for you. Yep. So, but uh, yeah, definitely it does have batching support. So, um, okay. I think uh, we went back, huh? Okay, right. So on to uh, lookups. So uh, it's a bit more complicated, but um, it, it, it looks more complicated than it is. So lookups basically allow you to, you know, just enrich your, enrich your records. So as your records flow through, you can do a lookup in your database or something like that, right? Um, so in this case, in order to perform lookups, in order to create your own custom lookups, you need to create, you need to subclass the lookup um, class. And uh, basically how it works is there is a lookup transformer, which you add to any transforming reader. And, uh, and there, then you can specify your, your lookup. You can specify, in the lookup transformer, you basically specify the fields, which are the arguments to the lookup. So you say, you know, um, as I go through, uh, as, as you're looking up the data in my custom lookup, these are the fields that I want to pull from my record and send it to the custom lookup to do the lookup. And then you have the actual lookup, and then the next item here is overwrite field. So if it finds an existing field, then it can overwrite it or not. Now, there are a few methods here that you can implement if you like. So, but it's there as just provide you a hook into the system. So there's the join. So once it finds the uh, the record set that matches your your query, it'll it'll call this join method, and you can override it to do whatever you need. Uh, there's a no results, and then it's too many results, so if it finds more than one. So. so here's an example of that. Hopefully you can, you can uh, see it. So basically what this, cu what this uh, uh, custom lookup does is it, um, it tries to use some lookup, some translation service. For example, maybe using Google Translate or some other, or maybe you have a database of all your, your phrases in, in that maps English to you know, French or whatever, right? So 
all it's doing is it, it'll look up in, in whatever system and try to, um, to put in the new value. So we don't actually have a system here, so all it's going to do is just add in just the language suffix at the end of the phrase. So, all right, so onto the code. Um, the first, uh, the field, the property here it says source language. That's the language that, you, that you're starting from. And the actual lookup takes in uh, just an array of keys. And these keys are the values that are coming from your, from your record. And these keys are what's going to actually be used to do the real, to do, to do the lookup. So it just says if the, so it, looking at the get method, if the keys are null or the keys, or if there isn't two of them, then just fail. Just throw in invalid arguments and uh, just set two properties on the exception. The first is arguments.expected. So I expected two arguments. And uh, what I found, arguments.found, I found these keys instead. So it'll expand that as needed. So if you saw that exception, it will say arguments.found and it'll show you, if, you know, each of the elements of the key, so as well, as well as how many are there. <coughs> okay, so after the exception, after the, the uh, argument check, we just pull out the values of the keys. So we just get the target language and the source phrase. So those are the two arguments that we got in. And then we actually just do the translation, which is get translation. We pass in those two arguments, target language, and the source phrase, so maybe the target language is French, the source phrase is hello, and then the target phrase would be, what is the French for hello? I hello. Oh. <laughs> awesome, awesome, okay. It's a good program. Translation done in like 10 lines of code, right? Google has nothing on me. <laughs> All right, so. Yeah, I mean, plug in whatever transformation uh, engine you're, you're, you're using. Um, okay, so once we get the, the, the target phrase, we just create a new record, um, add the, the target phrase record uh, field to that record, and then just return, return that record as a, as a list of records. And the reason that we don't just return one record is because you can match many, right? There's a potential, potential to match many or, or none. So. Um, yeah, and then the, the next method is just actually doing the translation magic, the dash dash French. Um, okay, so finally in that bottom left box, if you want to use this, what we do is we create a transforming reader, we uh, create a new lookup transformer, we say these are the fields from the source record that I want to use, in this case the locale and the value, so this is my, my, uh, my target language and, um, and, source, and, and source phrase, and then we add the transforming lookup and just say English is the source. So uh, you can see on the right side, which you know, just the output, um, you can see that now we've got a, a fourth field, which is that target phrase. And uh, in the case that it's uh, not English to English, then it'll just tack on the fake language at the end. That's about it. So, all right. So that's about it in terms of uh, customizations. Any questions on, uh, on that? Is this the pattern you would use, say, if you had a, like, you often have these um, like lookup tables in a database where you translate codes into longer things. Is, is this the sort of pattern you would use to do that kind of lookup? Uh, yeah, so there, there's a, there are a couple things. So one is there's a built-in database lookup. So okay. you can just specify the, the query in, it's just one line, so you don't have to. Have to yeah, and the other thing is there's caching as well. So instead of like hitting the database every time, you can just wrap the transformer in a cache lookup and then it'll just, it'll do that. Yep. So, all right. So the last thing is, um, is we, we talked about a lot of code and, um, you know, just to get started, you have to, you have to go through all the code and figure out, you know, which readers and writers and which transformers. So. What I'm trying to put together now is just a, a simple wizard that'll just generate the code for you. So if you go to northconcepts.com slash data pipeline slash builder, then you'll get this wizard, which it's, I'm just starting it, it's not really too far yet, but it's got uh, some of the inputs like database and CSV and some other stuff, and it's got a couple transformers. So if you go there, you just you know, fill in the, the form and click next, and then it'll generate the code. You just kind of paste it into your, into your app just to get started, right? That's about it. So it's not, um, it's not trying to be like a, 
you know, Oracle Warehouse Builder or something is just giving you the code to get started. So um, that's all. I mentioned that um, you can go to northconcepts.com slash tjug and grab your own uh, complimentary, no charge professional license. And um, that's about it. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any feature requests or any, uh, any bugs or anything, and I'll certainly address them post haste. Okay. You mentioned that it's Sorry, what's free and what's premium? Awesome. Um, so, uh, okay, there's, there are a couple things. Um, one is the uh, amount of data that you can process in one job. So freemium is like 1,000 records, and then it goes up from there like 50,000, quarter million, something like that, right? And then the business license you get, you get the, the professional, I think, is like everything, right? Um, so what distinguishes freemium from Premium, are, one is the number of records that you can process in any given, any given job. And the second is the formats that are supported. So for the freemium, it's like, you know, the basic ones like Excel, CSV, um, XML. And then for, for the premium, there's some others. Sorry, database is also part of the, uh, part of the freemium as well. So. Sorry, part of what? Database is part of the freemium. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. Yep. You're mentioning something about an expression language? Yes, yes. Um, we didn't cover that, but uh, yeah, there is an expression language. So where, where does that come in? Like, like what would you use that for? Um, okay, so we looked at how to create your own custom filters, for example. Um, so instead of you know, creating your own filter, you can just pass in a filter expression and uh, just write, write it in. It's almost Java, but it's, um, it, it has a few built-in things for handling like, like uh, dates and, and, and periods and things like that. So you can say something like, um, only give me records that are like two years old, right? So you can say where, you know, date is greater than two years, right? So just a little syntax sugar, I guess. Yeah. So you could use it for filters. Um, you can use it for um, assigning fields, like assigning calculated fields. So you have the transformer, you can just say, you know, uh, set field date or whatever and then here's the expression and it'll just put that in so and um you can kind of pull it out and use it on your own on your own like for your own uses but um that's a bit more involved yeah and what kind of dependencies are there like, i mean uh, do you have some dependency on a logging framework or xml parsers and stuff like that so yeah there are definitely some dependencies um So yeah, there are dependencies, and I mean, it uses log4j for logging, but I think the simple logging framework kind of abstracts that. So I think you can probably plug that in, yeah. um, and uh, it uses a couple uh, libraries for uh, for Excel. Um, but for XML, it's, um, it, it doesn't, I mean, it just uses what's in the JDK, okay. but um, it has a built-in XPath streaming thing, but that's, that's part of uh, data pipeline. Um, yeah, so I'm just trying to think of what other dependencies, of course you'd need to have your database drivers, or right? I mean, that's not part of it. Um, yeah, but there, there's, a, there's actually a list of, of the dependencies if you go to the, the data pipeline page, and you can see what, just go to get, getting started, and it'll show you what, um, uh, what the dependencies are, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I use it in um, I use it in uh, Tomcat and JBoss without any problems, and other companies use it in a lot of different things as well, like WebLogic and, and so on. So, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. What about um, logging? Logging not only sort of like when when a data transformation is run, but also what the, what the configuration of the pipeline was at the time it was run and how long it took and all that. Sort of just traceability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so the question is about logging. And um, so you're asking, can you log kind of like the metadata around the transformations? So yeah. like the, um, the uh, all the transformations that took place, I guess. So it's uh, like, whoops, last week when it ran overnight, uh, didn't work right. 
Yeah. And I want to see what the pipeline configuration was. Right, right. The so there isn't something right now that will tell you what all the transformations were. And, but now that you mentioned it, that's probably pretty easy to do just because, I mean, if you see it with the exception, yeah, we can tell everything. So, that, yeah, yeah you, you can basically just go through the, the, the graph. It shouldn't be, it's not even really a graph. It's more like a, a list. But, um, and the other thing you asked is about, like, the metrics around it, like how long did the transformation take and so on. So there's, there are a couple things. There's a metering uh, reader and writer, which will um, grab statistics. And there's also the, uh, the actual job. The job will actually give you some information there. So it, it's not exactly what you're asking for, but I think the hooks are there to be okay. able to, to log that to a, a file or a database or something like that. Cool. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's an interesting idea, just logging the graph of all well, the transformations. So I'll uh, put that on the list. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So any other questions, um, use cases? Um, in terms of uh, like using data pipeline, I mean, you can plug it into your, your web apps, um, your data transformation applications. Like I worked in, um, in telco and telecommunications and we, we do stuff like this all the time and, and uh, in finance as well. It's pretty surprising like how many custom apps that are there. Like even when you have like the build, the big, you know, Oracle warehouse builder or, um, you know, the other ETLs or so on, that there's still like these custom apps that are built. So this is where something like this fits in. So. Yeah, I like, I like it personally. I used to work, Jeff did too, at a, at a place called SQL Power that had an ETL tool. I think ETL tools with GUIs are a little bit too high level for like, almost every use case. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> I'm going to quote you. No, I won't quote you. <laughs> I won't quote you. You need some custom code to, to yeah. like, get the job done. So a framework is good, because otherwise you could end up with like a, a different disaster at every use case. But having a framework like this, that, that you still have the opportunity to write code uh, to do the specific thing, uh, I think is a sweet spot. Yeah, yeah you know, um, definitely that's how I felt. And one thing I, I, I struggle with is, um, is there a space between you know, doing it in Java and declarative, like doing it like, you know, yeah. maybe in XML, like somewhere in between. So I'm, you know, I, I think about that, but um, I haven't really had a, a strong use case for that at this point. Declarative is so. nice because you can spit out like a big picture of what the whole transformation looks like. Yeah, But yeah. there's going to be like the mystery node in the middle. It's like a custom step yeah. that you can't get away from. It doesn't actually do anything in the diagram. Yeah. So, yeah, good, good. Okay, I think uh, I don't hear any other questions. So thank you all for coming. Thanks for listening. Um, any, uh, any feedback or questions, you can just uh, email me, uh, deli.taylor at gmail.com or northconcepts.com. It'll all come to me. So, perfect. All right, thank you very much. Thanks.